Because this is one of those weeks where you don't see the sermon title printed in your bulletin. You think we see it up here, right? Um, usually, by the midweek, I kind of have a sense of where God is calling us to go in the week. Uh, I wrestled and struggled a lot this week. Uh, so we didn't, when we printed the bulletin on Thursday morning, I wasn't quite sure where God was calling us to go um, with the story that's set before us. So you'll see the title up there, not in your bulletin. This week's sermon title is Make Christianity Great Again. My friends, if you'll pray with me. Oh, dear Jesus, oh God, most magnificent Holy Spirit, in your triune being, we pray that you show yourselves to us this day, inspire us, enlighten us, put that spark within us that we know is already there. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every heart be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So last week, we talked about the death of King Saul and the death of his son, Jonathan. In our travels through the books of Samuel this summer, we're actually going to take a step back in our story. We kind of skipped a little bit of ahead. So we're going to go back and look at one of the stories, something that happened while Jonathan and, Dave, or Jonathan and Saul were still alive. Now the saga of David and Goliath that we heard this morning is probably one of the better known stories about King David in our Bibles. Many non-Christians are even familiar with this story as it resonates throughout our secular society as well. So much so that we even think about David and Goliath as that struggle between the weak and the powerful. Thinking about that story of David and Goliath as being the underdog who defeats the odds. In our Bible story, Goliath is the champion of the Philistine army. He is literally, literally and figuratively, he's a giant of a man. Depending on estimates of how the heights are interpreted, he's somewhere between 7 and 10 feet tall. So huge. Now the Philistines were sworn enemies of the ancient Israelites. The two had been in perpetual war since the time of Joshua. So basically, they've been constantly in battle for about 200 years. This was a very hostile relationship. And King Saul, we learn, is making no real progress in this ongoing war. So enter from stage left the young King David. Who, if we remember, David has been secretly anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the second king of Israel, to be the next king of Israel. So we have a little bit of tension going on at this time as we acknowledge that we have two kings, two anointed kings for God's chosen people at this time. So against all odds, David, this young little shepherd from seemingly almost out of nowhere, he has no military training, no armor, no battle experience. He shows up and defeats this mighty giant, this powerful, well-armed Goliath. Now, we usually like to remember this story when we see an unlikely winner prevail. I can even imagine a day, hopefully not too far in the distant future, where we use the story of David and Goliath and compare that story to our own Cleveland Browns. That scruffy little team who, against all odds, wins the Super Bowl. Yay! And who doesn't love to root for the underdog? The American colonies were an underdog when we rose up to fight the might of the British Empire. Susan B. Anthony was an underdog when she rose up and began the struggle for the women's rights to vote. And which one of us sitting here did not enjoy watching our underdog in Ohio native Red Gerard win Olympic gold just a few months ago? 
The very notion of the American dream is an underdog story. In this country of ours, we afford such great opportunity that we like to believe that it even allows for a person to go from extreme poverty to extreme wealth all in one single lifetime. But of course, that too is a dream. But these underdog stories are so ingrained in who we are that we even like to imagine ourselves as the underdog. We like to imagine ourselves as the ones who are the unlikely heroes. And we like to do that a lot. Both of our major political parties in this country love to play on that internal desire that we have to be that underdog. Our democratic politicians like to pretend that they are fighting for the least among us. And our Republican politicians like to pretend that they are speaking for the forgotten people in our society. They both want to paint their supporters as the underdogs so that we can fight Goliath. So that we can cast ourselves as the righteous ones. Cast ourselves as the ones who are the underdogs fighting for the e against the evils in the world around us. Even as good as it feels for us to feel like that unlikely hero, that unlikely underdog, we are more like Goliath, my friends. We are less, less like David than we hope. We are not the underdogs. We are not the long shots. We are the powerful. We like the story of the underdogs because it paints us like we can win, think we can win against all odds. In reality, though, the underdog doesn't usually win. In the 1830s, the underdogs were the Cherokee tribes of the Carolinas and Georgia who were forcibly marched over 1,000 miles to a reservation so far away from their homeland. 4,000 of them died in that trail of tears. In the 1870s, the underdogs were newly freed African Americans, many of whom descendants still face systemic obstacles in this country. And of course today we see the underdogs of migrant and refugee families fleeing violence and hostile governments in many Latin American towns and villages. Now, it has been suggested to me on more than one occasion that the church is not the time or place to talk about such things. But if not here, where? I've been told that church leaders should not be political, but the gospel is a political message, my friends. The Bible is a political book. This flag in our sanctuary is a political symbol. If we are to learn anything from the life of Jesus Christ, surely we are meant to learn that whenever and wherever we see injustice, none of us is meant to be silent. There is a vast difference between political and partisan. Standing up for justice is inherently political, but it should not and is not partisan. Justice is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. First and foremost, we are Christians. Anything else that we are, American, Republican, Democrat, Independent, all of that is a very distant second. We are Christians first. None of our affiliations, none of our beliefs should come before us being disciples of Jesus Christ. Nothing, absolutely nothing, should come first before us doing our very best to live out the Great Commission to go out and spread the gospel in this world. Jesus commands us in Matthew 28 that we go forth unto all nations, teaching people to obey everything that Christ taught us. All nations. That includes our own nation. Christ taught us that the whole of the gospel could be summed up in two commandments. First, that we are to love the Lord our God with all our hearts and all our souls and all our minds. And second, 
that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. All of our neighbors in every nation. Now this morning I have no partisan political solutions to offer for the crisis that is taking place on our southern border. But what I do have to offer is the word of God. The books of Moses tell us that when a foreigner resides with you in your land, you shall not mistreat them. The foreigner who resides with you shall be to you as the native born. Love them as yourself. Love them as yourself. Does this sound familiar? I hope so. Because Jesus did not pull these, this message out of thin air. This was God's plan for us since the very beginning. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus goes on to teach us that it is our job to show mercy to our neighbors. Now we know and we believe, and as we rightly should, that it is not the job of our government to instill our morality. That is the job of our churches. And our moral duty is to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. Our moral duty is to help friends and neighbors live in peace. Especially our children. Our moral duty is to follow the will of our God, even when it conflicts with the laws of humanity. And walking the path of Christ is a very difficult task. I know this, my friends. Each of us, myself included, fail every day. And we live in a world that is confounded with sin and intolerance. And it's not easy for us to make a choice that will put ourselves not in that first position. But if we are brave and if we are free, then we can do these things. Christ did not come for the righteous, but for the sinners. Christ did not come for the powerful, but for the weak. Jesus was, is, and always will be the greatest underdog. This dark-skinned Jew from a nowhere little town out in the middle of the desert rose up to fight not only the might of the Roman Empire, but even defeated the power of death. And in my whole life, I never thought that I would see eye to eye with someone like our Southern Baptist brother, Franklin Graham. But a few weeks ago, he renounced the separation of migrant and children, migrant families that are fleeing into our country across our southern border. And I applaud him for that. Despite all of our problems, we live in a country of relative safety and freedom. I hope that none of us ever has to know the terror of sneaking out and fleeing our homelands in the middle of the night. I hope that none of us ever know what it feels like to take our children and walk hundreds of miles to escape violence. And many of you in this, the pews today hold deep partisan convictions on how our country should best move forward. And I encourage each of you with your disparate opinions, your disparate views, to contact your representative, representatives and your our senators with our Christ-centered ideas. But please, in doing so, in having these conversations amongst the men and women in our own community and in the broader world, let's remember to treat each other with respect and love. We are commanded by God to love each other. That doesn't mean that we always like each other. And that's okay. Let us not forget that each of us is a child of God. So when we think about the words we use each and every day, let us not forget that our president, Donald Trump, is a child of God. That Nancy Pelosi and Hillary Clinton are children of God. That Rob Portman and Sherrod Brown are children of God. We can disagree with all of them, but we should treat them with love and respect the way Christ intended us to do. And of course, let us not forget that our undocumented migrant neighbors are children of our God. And this is a radical thought in our world today, I know that. But the Bible is a radical book. The gospel is a radical message. And let us not forget 
the foundation of our faith, the faith that we still cling to today, began with a small little minority community who faced oppression at every single turn. I pray that we can stop being the Goliath and be more like David. I pray that we will make the hard choices to put our faith before our partisan political views. I pray that we can put Christ first. I pray that we can be the land of the free and the home of the brave. And I pray that we can make Christianity great again. May it be so. Home by Warsan Shire. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run through the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats, and the boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you. Fire under feet, hot blood in your belly, and even then, you carry the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in an airport toilet, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear you wouldn't be going back. You have to understand, no one would put their children in a boat unless the sea is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the gallbladder of a truck feeding on newspaper unless the miles traveled mean something more than the journey. No one crawls under fences. No one wants to be beaten, pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a sea on fire and one prison guard in the night is better than a truckload man who loved a father. No one could take it. No one could stomach it. No one's skin would be tough enough. The go-home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry with their hands out, they smell strange, savage, messed up their country, and now they want to mess up ours. How did words, the dirty looks, roll off your backs? Maybe because the blow is softer than a limb torn off? or the words are more tender than men between your legs, or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child's body in pieces. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun, and no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore, unless home told you to quicken your legs, leave your clothes behind, crawl through the desert, wade through oceans, drown, save, be hungry, beg, Forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave. Run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. <laughs>